that we should always deal with it as a seminar, okay? Because since this appears to be one of those Henry V moments, uh, we few, we happy few, uh, feel free to interrupt me uh, in mid-sentence uh, at any point in time, honestly. I think we, we, with such a small group, we can dispense with a choreography that usually underpins uh, a central lecture, as it were. Mm. Okay, um, in so many ways, the really fun moment of this book was writing the introduction, because that's when you set up your predecessors for a fall. That's what academics are like. Uh, this one is by a historian called Peter Bell, who, amongst other terms, uses, and he's not far off the mark, because he's basically just saying this is how this particular decision has been assessed and valued in 70 years of historiography. Freakish and irrational. Whichever way you look at it, it doesn't make sense. It makes sense if you consider the possibility that this man was essentially set on a course of self-immolation. I'm not ruling out the fact, okay, somebody nuts enough to give us the Holocaust might do that too. We can't essentially ignore the simple reality that in the first week of December 41, Germany ruled the European continent. And it's really difficult to find a compelling reason why would somebody in that sort of position want to fall on their sword. So basically, I set out literally nine years ago, just the other day, I found a few notes I wrote to myself, nearly failed it, nine years ago, nine bloody years. Um, I basically just said to myself, let's look at the context, okay? Because believe it or not, nobody has, okay? Until now, we have four articles on this decision, four articles, most of which are basically completely misleading. Imagine, if, if you will for a moment, that the run-up to the decision for Operation Barbarossa to invade the Soviet Union had been dealt with in four articles over the last 70 years. You would probably say that's a wee bit inadequate. It falls just a little bit short of our expectations. Or with another decision, which is, as far as the ultimate fate of the Third Reich is concerned, every bit, every bit is crucial. We've got four articles, only one of them of any length. Okay, just to right from the start, need to clarify one thing. There is a school of thought there, which is, which has been essentially maintained by some pretty big names in contemporary history, like Gerd Weinberg and Jochen Thies, that basically maintains that with Adolf Hitler, you have to deal with the very the cold, hard reality that he wanted the rule of the world, that he wanted essentially, a, you could say, a unipolar world not as in every single square inch of the Earth's surface being patrolled by German soldiers, but yes, in the sense that every other power on the planet basically kowtows to you out of their own free will or not. Um, I have to say that after spend, having spent nine years perusing documents from precisely that very year, when the success of the German armed forces in the field might have, up to a certain point, legitimized entertaining such fantasies, I have not found a shred of evidence. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Not, not from, a, uh, from a senior Wehrmacht command, not from an economic office, uh, not from any, any of the witnesses hanging around Führer's headquarters. I'm 
basically I give you here the Messerschmitt 264 prototype, which undoubtedly you recognize straight away, <laughs> because this is usually associated with, shall we say, plans to literally begin strategic air warfare from Germany, or rather occupied Europe, against the United States. Counterfactual novelists that essentially give us a world dominated by the Third Reich, basically at some point or other involve the Messerschmitt 264. This, this thing has, you could say, evil, you could say, oozing from every <laughs> single rivet. Okay, uh, just brief moment in time here, just to take a look at what my predecessors had to say on the subject. Andreas Hilsruber, who is, shall we say, yeah, he's basically how best to describe it? Well, among German, his, uh, German contemporary historians uh, discussing, discussing the Third Reich, he's really one of the apex predators. Okay, you don't get to be much bigger than that. 1965, he reached the conclusion that, well, early December 1941, Mr. Hitler is completely at his wit's end with regards to the strategic pursuit of the war. He senses that he has been checkmated. He realizes that the blitzkrieg has stalled outside Moscow, hence the war is lost, hence he needs to do something which at least somehow suggests that he's still holding on to the initiative. And for want of anything better to do, you just declare war on the United States. <laughs> and this, well, you may laugh at it, but this school of thought has essentially considerable staying power. The number of historians who've quoted it is quite impressive including a number of very big names. Okay, Gerhard Weinberg is, shall we say, is to be commended for at least making the attempt to assess, shall we say, the whole conundrum from a strategic point of view. Never mind that the man had an attitude problem the size of Texas. Could there have been a rationale? And here, essentially, he came to the conclusion that the Germans had been aiming for war since mid-1939, war with the United States, that is, sorry, and that the driving elements had been the uh, enhanced opportunities for submarine warfare, especially in the coastal waters of the United States, concern of the Japanese willingness to join the war, and of course, a, a racist ideology which led him to chronically underrate American potential, with the possible exception of concern over the Japanese willingness to stay the course, all wrong, I'm afraid. Eberhard Jekyll, one year later, basically took the line that on the German side, the entry into the war by the United States had been deemed as unavoidable, and therefore it made sense, from Hitler's point of view, to split the enemy potential between two main theatres, Atlantic and Pacific. It did not, however, stop to explain when exactly the, this, the sense of this inevitability actually set in. Okay, we left this wide open. It was only a brief article in any case. Uh, Ian Kershaw has written by far the longest article uh, on the subject, uh, nearly 50 pages. He basically takes the line of Eberhard Jekyll, but he places great stress on the need that, uh, on the need to, you could say, refocus the whole thing on the war in the North Atlantic. That American U.S. Navy interference with the German waging of the Battle of the Atlantic was essentially a trigger. Here we are looking at an interesting half truth, as we will see in a little while. But crucially, okay, Gil Gruber's argument you can disregard. It has a leg, shall we say, it reflects. It reflects to a considerable extent, shall we say, psychological issues of the early German post war generation. He was born in 1927. And that essentially can explain a lot. Mostly, however, you're dealing with uh, important weaknesses and crucially omissions. Um, I don't know, we might as well jump ahead for a moment. 
Nobody has addressed the question of what was the trigger. The Americans in 1941 did about seven different things, any, of, any one of which could have been regarded as the trigger, as in Adolf, I mean, literally teddy bear throwing time in the Reich Chancellery, Adolf decided, right, that is it, I'm, not, I'm no longer putting up with this sort of nonsense. But nobody has identified, essentially, by a look at, shall we say, the contextual evidence of which particular incident probably caused this spill. Crucially, as far as the Jekyll theory is concerned, and many, many historians have followed Jekyll, almost as many as Gil Gruber, um, why on earth should the Americans do you the favor of splitting their resources? Why don't they just ignore the Pacific theater? They were not that mad keen on defending the colonial possessions of the Dutch and the British and throw everything they have in the general direction of Europe straight away. It's not like you can force them to do either, okay? And if they decide to essentially deploy what they have straight away off the line of march to support the British in the Middle East and on the home islands, then you could find yourself in deep doo -doo. Nobody, absolutely nobody, not Kershaw, not Jekyll, not Hill Gruber, have actually looked at Russia. Okay? In December of 1941, close to 90% of the German army and 90% of the air force are deployed in Russia, or moving into Russia, which has been, or redeploying from Russia. It is, you could say, the center of the war. And nobody has essentially even attempted an even, shall we say, superficial examination of the extent to which the situation in Russia would have impinged on Hitler's decision making. It's usually settled with the fact that he was stalled outside Moscow, all of a sudden he realized, oh my God, I've lost the war, then I might as well bring the house down in style. Nobody's ever looked at the air war or the production crisis in the war economy because the German war economy in the autumn of 1941 is facing some interesting issues. Okay, briefly, Hitler's view of America. In short, there's usually talk of him being A, a racist, B, an anti-Semite. I think we can take that as red. However, crucially, and strangely enough, he does not underrate the Americans. There is a ton and a half of evidence of what he had to say about the United States in the 20s and early 30s. Basically, memoirs from hangers on, recordings of private conversations, public speeches, manuscripts that were published and others that were not. And all of them have a unifying theme. Whenever they touch on the United States, it's basically admiration. Not admiration as in, I love them, more like admiration in, my God, these people are going places. We've got to have to, we have to watch them because otherwise they will eat us for breakfast. In so many ways, this is somebody who actually sees the Americans at 10, 20 years time in the future, rising to their future status as superpower. Racism and anti-Semitism doesn't come into it. It really, really doesn't. Say it may be irritating, it may be grating, it may be you could say we're looking at a racist today, you could say, whose views of the world are not totally skewed by his racism, but basically his assessment of American economic potential is largely correct, in some cases remarkably prescient. Okay, while we're on the subject of premonitions of death. Hill Gruber and certainly some of the people who followed him had but basically said in so many words that this guy wanted self-immolation. He wanted to bring the house down in style. Well, there is at least, you could say, one conceivable reason why he why, might want to do that. Since 1994, we have known that he was mortally ill with Parkinson's. 
So just about everything hinges on assessing whether he could have known of this condition. Never mind whether he had it or not. Never mind whether he had something else. Never mind whether his Parkinson was compounded or basically, in, to some extent, helped by a possible drug addiction. To a historian, all these points are largely irrelevant. What matters is what he could have known when. There, luckily, it's, it was the only chapter where I had some outside help where I really was able to stand the shoulder, on the shoulders of somebody who came before me, a German neurologist at the University of Köln, who did really remarkable research uh, in the sense that uh, she sat down and watched all the contemporary newsreels that showed him in motion, but out of sequence. Wouldn't have worked with somebody like myself, because never mind the sequence, if I had seen him really essentially at a reception for a foreign head of state in a certain building and I'd seen him moreover that say the trees were in full bloom I would have said right that's April 40 April 1943 but that didn't work for her okay when she essentially shuffled the deck of cards anew she really was starting from scratch when she did a report on every single instance where he was in mo where he was seen in motion and were essentially detailing whether there were any symptoms to be seen of any kind of degenerative condition like Parkinson's. And she came to the conclusion, yes, he was almost certainly ill with Parkinson's, uh, but based on what her findings and after perusing the personal diary of his, uh, of his GP, I've come to the conclusion that he had no way of knowing this, not before December 11th, 1941. So we're back to actually debating the possibility of a genuine strategy. Maybe this guy wasn't that mad keen on dying after all. Maybe he really wanted to create the world imagined by Robert Harris and Fatherland. Okay, um, the situation in the United States and the shifting moods of public opinion are something of which he kept, on which he kept taps on an almost daily basis. He essentially was not content with intelligence summaries. Thanks to, the pers to some personal notes taken by an army ADC, we know that he essentially he saw many of the messages from the embassy in Washington himself. He wanted the raw intelligence, a bit like Churchill and the ultra decrypts. It was important to him. He was always a bit of a skeptic about the possibilities that Charles Lindbergh and the America First Committee might have to actually turn the country around because he realized that the key public opinion makers were more and more, shall we say, shifting in favor of the war. Now, the threat which America posed to Nazi Germany pre Pearl Harbor comes in different forms. Okay? First, there is the neutrality patrol. The Americans claim a huge swathe of ocean, or almost like a third of the Atlantic, in front of the Americas, and they patrol these waters with their surface vessels literally starting in the second month of World War II. Uh, whenever they come across a German raider or a German blockade runner or German merchantman trying to make a home run from Valparaiso or some such place, they do a really unfair thing. They squeal. They squeal and before, before you know it, the French or the Royal Navy comes running and the game is up. So much for neutrality. It's a neutrality patrol that behaves in a thoroughly unneutral fashion. Then, of course, there are the lend lease deliveries starting in March of 1941, which is all about getting the goodies you need for a total war while not paying for them, at least not just yet. The occupation of Iceland is pretty blatant stuff. Uh, seriously annoyed, annoyed him. We know this because of the minutes of your conversation he had with the Japanese ambassador. And then finally, mid-September 1941, convoy escort. However, crucially, 
you get the end of the new charity laws and that's always overlooked. Nobody has essentially mentioned this in any shape or form thus far. No one. And I don't know why. It's not exactly a secret. And the source which records a commentary by him from November 1939 where he states unambiguously the Americans ever abolished their neutrality legislation then we know we'll be at war with them in a few months. Amongst other things, the neutrality legislation said quite unambiguously that American vessels cannot steam into British ports. You can sell them arms, but they have to come and fetch them themselves. They have to pay for them in cash and they have to fetch them themselves in British flagships. The neutrality, you could say abolishing the neutrality law on November 13th, 1941 is a huge turning point. That means that all of a sudden passenger liners, remember the Lusitania, and merchantmen can essentially start queuing up outside the Western approaches and that will lead to civilian losses. The Americans have been remarkably cool about losing warships to the U-boats, not so when there were civilian victims included. Okay, this one is my favorite. Okay, we could easily, if you, if you, if you wanted me to dig into this in a really big way, we would be here till breakfast. I mean, and I would put to you that the one and only occasion where you might just feel almost inclined to sympathize with the plight of a senior Nazi functionary is where foreign relations with Japan are concerned. Okay? It's a, it's a state which requires the redefinition of the term dysfunctional. Essentially what you have is an emperor who nominally rules over everything and decides nothing. And you have a largely castrated parliament. You have various power groupings which are more at war with each other than the enemy. You have the royal household. You have a couple of ministries, especially the treasury and foreign affairs, who are quite important, who cannot be ignored. You have the two armed services. And these are kept, shall we say, relations between these and sometimes in between factions within one of them, the army is a particularly desperate case, are such that if you try to make sense of this as a foreigner, as an outsider, even an outsider with a few inside sources, you can, you can go simple trying to make sense of Japanese domestic politics. I could literally, like I say, to to spare you the extended remix, which would have us here for several hours. I'll just give you one example. Over a period of 72 hours, it was nothing more than that, first week of August 1941, the Japanese government in closed session, or rather the so-called liaison conference, where they got together with the military, decided, number one, we're not going to war with Soviet Russia even though the Germans right now appear to be interested. The German admiral, discussing the same subject with a Japanese naval attaché in Germany, is told exactly the same. But on the previous day, the Japanese military attaché rocked up outside the office of the army commander-in-chief and told him, we're going to war against Russia in a month's time. And it went down to specifics as in which division is going to cross the border where and when they were going to converge on bloody Boston. This was a lieutenant general. Obviously, somebody somewhere hadn't got the memo. Now, imagine, if you will, if you're the recipient of such intelligence on the German side, you end up wondering, who are these people? Who are these people? What are they up to? What do they want from life? Do they even want to live on this planet? because maybe they're better off in a country called Oz. Honestly, it's Japan. The Japan of the period is the most amazing setup you've ever seen. And the Germans, in the end, try to essentially handle this pragmatically and so far as they can, okay? For instance, 
A lot has been made by my predecessors of the fact that the Germans, on the, in the last, day, last couple of days of June 1941, actually asked the Japanese officially, unambiguously, to take part in the war against the Soviet Union. This is basically read as one number one. The fact that Ribbentrop, the foreign secretary, went rogue, went off the, you could say, went a bit off peace, didn't deal with this with Hitler. And there may be some truth to this, it's difficult to say. And more importantly, people generally imply that the Germans did, they had realized what desperate straits they were in, in Russia. And that's simply not true. Not late June. Late June, they're doing fine. They're happy. They're happy with their lot and they're happy in their work. Nothing, everything, everything appears to be going just fine in Russia. The reason why the Germans, after pestering the Japanese for months to essentially take an interest in Singapore, all of a sudden change targets, is because they've had a telegram on June 6th from their embassy in Tokyo telling them, listen, the Japanese are not more going to move against the Dutch or the Brits because they're terrified the Americans might come in. It's not going to happen. Forget it. Never mind what Vice Admiral Fujita might have told you the other day. What might happen, however, is them joining a war against Russia. To which Ribbentrop just said, fine, good enough for government work. Because irrespective of what might happen, it will get, send the sort of message we want to the Americans. It will tell the Americans <coughs> that the Japanese are literally wedding themselves to the idea of the tripartite pact. That they are becoming an ever closer body of Nazi Germany. And there will be absolutely no chance of the Americans ever, ever, ever striking a deal with the Japanese. Which is something which the Germans were quite concerned about in the spring and summer of 1941. Uh, finally, the Japanese make the offer that changes everything. And the liaison conference on November 2nd, 1941, decides right war with the Americans and the British and the Dutch and the Aussies and the New Zealanders, or just about everybody on the planet, who still left, you could say, unoccupied. Is it a done deal? We're going to do it. Not unless, say, the Americans were to more or less surrender at the talks that are still taking place in Washington. They turn to the Germans, tell them it's really going to happen. And what do the Germans do? First thing, Ribbentrop tries another last ditch attempt to convince the Japanese not to extend their war to the Americans. He started doing this in February 1941. In November, he picks up again. He tries to convince them not to bring the Americans into the war. It's only after the Americans have abolished their neutrality legislation that everybody on the German side goes like, yeah, right, whatever, it's going to happen anyway. Which still leaves us with one final riddle to solve. Why the rush? Why did the Germans not simply give themselves a little bit more time after Pearl Harbor? There's a, a positively unseemly rush to war. Why not leave the Japanese twisting in the wind if only for an extra week? Maybe convince them to do you the odd favor too, because until now they've been rubbish allies in all sorts of ways. I could literally give you a seminar on that as well, but it literally would take us too far. Why this unseemly rush? Well, one of, one of the reasons, I dare say it is the reason, and I can claim no merit in this, it's not something which I sensed, you could say, it's not, it's not like I caught a whiff of this in the air, I simply tripped over the right file as I was doing my research, is that even post Pearl Harbor, Hitler is convinced, positively convinced, I'm not sure it lasts into 1942, but certainly in the first two, three weeks after Pearl Harbor, he is convinced that the Americans might still detach the Japanese from the Alliance by essentially allowing them to keep some of their recent conquests. As in, by all means, hang on to Borneo, hang on to Malaya, give us back the rest, and let's be friends. Which 
His ambassador and his military attaché undoubtedly would have told him, you're nuts. It's never going to happen. The Americans are mad as hornets. They're getting ready to toss nukes around the place. Why? Well, it hasn't been invented. <laughs> They're getting busy inventing it. <laughs> However, by this moment, British and Thompson are already incarcerated in the Greenbrier Hotel in New Jersey. So there's nobody to apprise Hitler of the fact that the Americans are really mad as hornets and that nobody in Washington is talking about gifting Malaya or Borneo to the Japanese. But it explains a rush. And this is something where I have a pretty good paper trail. At least first 10 days or so of the war, he really does believe the Japanese or somebody on the Japanese side might still do the dirty on them, still do a last minute deal with the Americans and maybe even, I don't know, maybe they would write a so sorry note over Pearl Harbor. Like I say, total lunacy. Total lunacy. And I think it's the one case where he really allows ideology to run away with him. He essentially doesn't realize that democracies can get as exasperated of acts of war as dictatorships. Okay, this was my second largest chapter. Again, I, I didn't want for sources, a German army sources for 1941 are almost all complete. What, 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 what you have to realize is that in August 41, German war in Russia enters a bit of a hiatus and there's a genuine sense of crisis, especially in the sector of army group center because the Soviets are actually holding firm. Then you get the destruction of the Kiev grouping in mid-September, and then in early October, a similar victory against the armies deployed to the southwest of Moscow to bar, you would say, a German approach. We're talking two spectacular game-changing defeats. Now we know that even that was not, not, not enough, couldn't have been enough, but with a number of even semi-trained soldiers, the Soviets were still keeping in reserve. But what matters is perception. I always tell my students in Santos that the perception of reality weighs 10 times more than reality. And for a period of about at least four weeks, and probably more, people on the German side are convinced that the war in Russia is, if not finished, then basically something which will require some major mopping up. And this is basically, this was lost in the din created by events that followed in September, and I'm sorry, in December 41 and January 1942, when all of a sudden Army Group Center is fighting for its life outside Moscow. But from about mid-October to certainly late November, they are convinced that things in Russia are well in their hands. Amongst other things, what gives them the, the reassurance is hang on, the fact that they have the Donbass region. The Donbass region is in the news on a fairly regular basis. It's the Donetsk, okay, where Putin has set up these two satellite republics of his just to show the world that he still can. And back in the 30s and 40s, it really was hugely important. It was hugely important to the Soviet economy. It was a sort of rural area of the Soviet economy and German military intelligence, not Hitler, wasn't, it's not something which he essentially plucked out of thin air. It's, what, it's essentially what military intelligence was telling him that as regards heavy industry, and you certainly are not going to get new howitzers and new tanks and new self-propelled guns without heavy industry. When you take the Donetsk region, then the output is reduced by 70%. If you have the Donetsk, it's a real game changer. As for the fact, I think I'll have to change the sequence there. As for the fact that the offensive stalls outside Moscow, we need to consider the following. Many handbooks in World War II will tell you that Hitler was sold on getting to Moscow, he wasn't. He wasn't. First of all, he's talked into the second drive on Moscow, the, the one that starts in mid-November 41 and peters out on, on December 5th. He's talked into it by Franz Halder and the Admiral Rusch. 
the Army Chief of Staff and Army Commander in Chief, uh, Commander in Chief respectively. Hitler is actually a happy little dictator at this moment in time. He is not mad keen on Moscow. They are the ones who want to do Moscow. If you follow, follow the entire paper trail for this period, there's not a shred of evidence that he's actually pushing events. He's being pushed into them. He's actually pretty lukewarm. And the campaign plan to take Moscow is farcical. It's farcical. Essentially, they, have, they are so limited in their logistics that they propose to set up a semicircle around Moscow. A semicircle around Moscow in the expectation that the, the capital will maybe fall at some point. There's no contingency for actually driving into Moscow or doing a complete encirclement. The only reason why they did this, of course, was really because they expected something to happen, as did in Charkov. In Charkov, basically, at, on the approach of the Germans, basically, what was left of the garrison uh, just bolted. Because most of the, uh, so, uh, the Red Army units that could have defended uh, Kiev had been essentially had been struck down in open ground to the west of the city. Now, something similar, hopefully, was going to happen with regards to Moscow. So you get this race against time in the second half of November 1941 with insufficient means and logistics that are shot to pieces. But crucially, and we have a beautifully preserved diary with appended documents for Army Group Center, at no point in time do you sense a sense of ur urgency on anybody's part. As in, oh my God, it's Moscow or bust. If we don't get there, then we're finished. Or it's literally, it's the future of the Third Reich hanging in the balance. Nothing of the kind. Nothing of the kind. Nothing could be further from the truth. And you get, you could say, similar instances in, sorry, uh, for, for, for the events in outside Leningrad with Army Group North and in, with Army Group South. The crises around Rostov, is, they are equally enlightening. In Rostov, there's a brief sense of crisis, even to the extent that Hitler flies out himself on December 2nd and 3rd to check for, check for himself what has happened, because there's basically been a case of miscommunication. And somebody on all commando this year has, has mis withheld a number of crucial messages. And he wants to sort this out because he's hopping mad and he makes all sorts of promises. And we know what he said at Rostov, sorry, not Rostov, Taganrog, where uh, the army group had set up its field HQ, because we've got two documents from essentially conversations that took place on the spot where he basically said to everybody else, well, it's a good thing I came by, but I can see that things are in hand. There is no sense of crisis. There is no sense of crisis. And what little sense of crisis he mentioned and was passed on to him had dissipated by the time he got back to East Russia. By that time, you could literally, because we've got a nice entry in the personal diary of Franz Haller, which basically indicates there is no sense of crisis. There is no sense of crisis. There is no doom and gloom. Nobody is thinking in terms of it's the end of days. Okay, more good news. Bomber Command throughout 1941 has been engaged, you could say, in the early phase of its war against German cities. This one is arguably, by a wide margin, the least well known. Okay, it's the least well known partly because it was so unsuccessful. Secondly, it didn't come with a sort of high drama which you get in, say, 1944, with, you could say, the, the aerial battles over Berlin, Nuremberg, and Leipzig. Uh, the Germans at the time barely had any night fighters to speak of. Most of their air defense was flak, but as of mid-41, radar directed flak. Uh, the Nazi hierarchy, oddly enough, is actually literally having kittens about these early British air raids, where in most instances Bomber Command couldn't guarantee to hit the floor when they fell out of bed. But they were having kittens over this, which is quite ridiculous. But then, in the late summer and autumn 1941, Bomber Command's losses start to go through the roof proportionally speaking, they are more serious than anything that happens in 1944. It's just, just that they are largely forgotten. It's mostly thanks to the introduction of the Würzburg 
gun lame later. And by November, December 1941, the, the offensive is actually being wound down. And the relevant sources on the German side again indicate that there's no sense of crisis. They feel that things are well in hand. So well in hand, in fact, that a large part of the Luftwaffe, which should have been supporting Army Group Center's drive on Moscow, is shifted to the Mediterranean. There, essentially, to help the Italians in North Africa and, more importantly, in their war against Malta, because the Regia Aeronautica's raids against Malta don't make much of an impression on the defense. So I would put to you that this is yet another indication that there is no sense of crisis. Things are just fine. Nobody is essentially tearing their hair out over, you could say, the future of the German war effort. Okay, any, sp any plane spotters in the room? Yeah. I'm a big plane spotter myself. <laughs> Nobody joined me. Okay. Uh, the Messerschmitt 210, as you undoubtedly knew, was to be the successor of the Messerschmitt 110, which is a much maligned twin engined heavy fighter, uh, which actually by and large did an extremely good job. Now, it has to be understood. That even though later in the war, you could say the, this idea of the heavy fighter, as shall we say, as it was used in the Luftwaffe, emerged from with a somewhat tattered reputation from World War II. Okay, the Messerschmitt 110 got a bit of a dropping during the Battle of Britain, it did extremely well in all campaigns before and after. But Battle of Britain was a low point, and the Messerschmitt 410, which is the successor to the uh, 210. Uh, got a similar dropping from American escort fighters in the skies over Germany in 1944. So they, they emerged with something of a tattered reputation. However, and this is the crucial bit, perception of reality. At the time, the Luftwaffe hierarchy felt, rightly or wrongly, that would be something for a separate seminar, that this type of plane was something they absolutely needed. It was a crucial element in their armory. And essentially, the Luftwaffe, which was supposed to roll up the British Middle East in 1942, would be supported by these beauties here, the Messerschmitt 210. Then, in a similar ilk, around the same time, we've got the Heinkel 177 heavy bomber, and we've got the Messerschmitt 264 long range strategic bomber. Uh, which is actually being considered for raids against the US. This is something more of a boutique product, you might say. The crucial thing is that all three were doing just fine until the very eve of December 11th, 1941. And it's literally in the days and weeks afterwards that all three prototypes are essentially discovered to be bucks. Quite serious bucks, too. In the case of the Messerschmitt 210, it leads to a major crisis. Major crisis in the higher in the higher echelons of the Luftwaffe and the sacking of Willy Messerschmitt from his own company. I mean, in many ways, it's the biggest weapons procurement scandal uh, of German military history, not just the Third Reich. And we don't have much evidence that Hitler at that point was that much airmined. But it would have been to some extent. And all he would have realized is that things were in hand. This thing, a little bit behind schedule, but getting the same thing this year, same year. And then literally in the weeks after December 11th, 1941, on cue, sometimes God has a sense of humor, these things start dropping out of the skies. Oh, mama, how inconvenient. Okay, how am I doing for time? Mm. Okay, uh, now we're getting to the Battle of the Atlantic. Battle of the Atlantic is again of some importance for two reasons. Uh, well, let's stay with one for a moment. Uh, most of my predecessors, to some extent, have alleged that either number one, Hitler was genuinely concerned about the decrease in U-boat kills 
in the second half of 1941. Okay? U-boat sinkings, even though the numbers of U-boats in the field, I'm not quite sure you could say in the field for the Navy, but here we go, on active duty actually starts to rise finally in June 1941. From July to December 41, despite the fact that U-boats out on patrol actually increase, sinkings decrease. As I'm sure you all know why. Imagine everybody has seen Enigma. You must. If you haven't, you must. That's what I always do with my field. I'm a bit of a film buff, can't help myself. Whenever I essentially I can throw a film recommendation at my at my students, I do impose this. Um, Enigma, um, not the imitation game. For God's sake, the imitation game is a wasted space. Um, but the Enigma is actually very, very, very good. Largely because they stuck close to the novel, which is excellent. So basically the convoy lanes are, rather the North Atlantic sea lanes are being swept clean of merchant traffic because convoys are being rerouted around wolf pack locations. And nobody's getting it. No, the penny doesn't drop, even though there's certainly one particular instance where frankly you end up wondering why everybody involved didn't have their head examined because the evidence was literally just jumping up and biting them in the backside. But Dönitz keeps insisting that all I need is more, okay? He doesn't want this sort of commerce warfare because Erich Reda, okay, he was at the Battle of Jutland. It was like his formative experience. He just wants big ships. He wants big ships. I hear this is the Bismarck in action. And he has always had this eagle-sized bee under his bonnet that you can essentially make it major impact, a decisive impact in the Battle of the Atlantic by deploying capital ships, even though what happened to the Graf Spee really should have essentially told him otherwise. Now his subordinate Karl Dönitz, needless to say, has different ideas with him. It's subs, 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 subs. And whenever they return in the hand it, he basically insists, there's nothing wrong, we just need a few more. Okay, let's look at the numbers, shall we? October 1939, big promises are made. Big promises. Erich Rehde is promised 368 subs. 368! To be available by the end of 1941. If he's a good boy and if he behaves himself. Not bad. Not bad. Even if you allow for the, the fact that this might include the subs in the training flotillas, it's still an awful lot. It's still an awful lot. Okay, January 41, okay, the numbers are being, shall we say, corrected downwards. They realize they got a bit carried away. With, the, with German uh, shipbuilding, the key, or rather in this case, subbuilding, the key constraint is always one thing, skilled German labor. Okay, you, you can do many things with slave labor, who are you essentially you import from other countries at gunpoint, but these are people who cannot build the sub. There are certain limitations. You're stuck with German skilled labor. And what's eating up German skilled labor is the maintenance of the capital ships, which drives units up the walls. Finally, by the day they declare war on the United States, they have 90 available. They're finally getting someplace and they have got uh, 70 more in the pipeline, which is actually pretty good going. All right. I mean, you're reaching a point where if you've got like 120, 130, 140 on the books, at least a third of them constantly on patrol on a good day more, and you're still not finding any convoys, then the penny might really drop, as in somebody's reading our emails. But oddly enough, it didn't come to the crunch. Something odd happened. Hang on. The ice jam. Okay. The U boat training program is located in the Baltic. And the winter of 1941 42 is brutal. It's absolutely brutal, not quite as brutal as the 39 40 winter, which was absolutely of historic proportions. But it's brutal and it basically collapses the U-boat training program. A few subs that were nearly finished with, shall we say, with B 
being readied by their crews for the first sortie, can, are still squeezed through the North Ostsee Canal into the North Sea. But apart from that, look at this. You have capital ships stuck in the ice on some days. I mean, these are dire conditions. And good old Adolf, so one of the things he would have considered before he declared war on the United States is, well, there's nothing else, I've got enough subs. No, you don't. Not any longer. Not for a few more months. Okay. Oddly enough, Erich Reder would have dismissed this. Erich Reder, interestingly enough, was constantly obsessing, not about subs, but what might allow him to do another sortie with his beloved capital ships. And he was concerned, oddly enough, about the American Neutrality Patrol of 1939 vintage, which is a bit of a laugh. Why? Because the capital ships need surface tankers. They need surface tankers. They need floating service stations to keep them in the game. And they, these get picked up. They get spotted. And if you've got half the American Navy and its air arm look, uh, out in force looking for them, you're not going to stay in the game for much longer. So what had Erich Reda up in arms and hopping mad were these behemoths. It was the US Atlantic Fleet, or rather its capital ships, not the destroyers escorting British convoys. The, the Germans sub-arm had only met American escorts on a couple of occasions in 1941. Why? Because they only intercepted any convoys on a couple of occasions. Especially September 41, there were a few encounters, but more often than not, in the second half of 41, they're just looking and not finding. So clashes with the US Navy are a bit of a moot point. They only happen on a couple of occasions. Okay, a couple of my colleagues have insisted that if it was an American interference in the Central Atlantic, it was basically the prospect of finding rich pickings in U.S. coastal waters. Because as you will know, from January to June 1942, there's a massacre of American merchant shipping in U.S. coastal waters, largely down to the dysfunctional, uh, dysfunctional escort arrangements on the American side. I mean, they... Admiral King really did drop the ball uh, on that occasion in a huge way. The thing is that if you look at any pre-Pearl Harbor document from, from the Kriegsmarine side of life, including a couple of personal memos from Karl Dönitz, the odd thing is that nobody's getting excited about the prospect of, a, of maybe operating in American coastal waters. There's almost supreme indifference to it. And why? Because there is a precedent in 1918. 1918, the Germans sorted seven subs to operate in US coastal waters. The first one enjoyed rich pickings. And then the Americans implemented convoy proceedings in a pretty sharpish fashion. And the second, third, fourth, and fifth sub they more or less returned empty-handed. Essentially, the success of German subs of the U.S. Eastern Seaboard, that's something that's hidden in the future. That's something that's known to us. But if you're on the German side making decisions in December 1941, it's an irrelevance. Why? Because there's a precedent. And the precedent wasn't exactly very encouraging. Okay, we're nearly finished. I promise. Um, again, here a subject of enormous importance. Um, normally economics are not a subject. You can say that by the nature of its subject it doesn't make for books that fly off the shelves. Okay? Books on the economy of Nazi Germany do. Okay? Because it can be argued that both, both with regards to the war against the British Empire and the war against the Soviet Union then you could say the margin for failure at a critical point in time in each case was fairly, was fairly, fairly narrow. That literally, they needed 50 extra subs 
for the Battle of the Atlantic. They needed two extra squadrons of focke wolf Commodores. They needed two extra Panzer divisions in Russia, that sort of thing. That sort of thing might tip, might just have tipped the balance. Who knows? At least it's the sort of speculation which is legitimate. And that's why um, we have had a lot of excellent scholarship on um, Nazi economics, if you will. Uh, but most of it uh, was only of marginal use to me. Because in my case, it was just down to the perception of things in November 41. In November 41, the German war economy in many areas isn't doing brilliantly. It's all about, um, you could say, how do you operate a hybrid economy which is capitalist in nature, but is being run by a totalitarian di dictatorship. In many ways, the Soviets had it easier. There, at least, nobody was under any illusion what the system was. It's a state-operated economy. And if you essentially don't sort your act out sharpish, it's you and your family off to the gulag. In, the, in Nazi Germany, oddly enough, you can't do these things. You still have a capitalist economy. It's profit-driven. They issue shares. It's still, in so many ways, a normal economy. But it's a normal economy under blockade normal economy that, for instance, can't use foreign exchange reserves freely because the state will not allow you to. So you have to find ways around this. Um, as far as we can help throughout 1940 and 41, and I've got pretty good paper trail in this, Adolf Hitler, whenever he involved himself in issues of war production, he was not an expert. A number of things completely passed him by, mostly because the subject was so complicated. It's still confusing us to this day. But he basically insisted, he kept insisting, listen, we have got X, amount X for labor available. We have got so much power available. We have got raw materials available. For God's sake, we're running Europe. All we need to do is find a way of bringing these three together in the right place at the right moment in time. And there was a precedent for this. In the immediate run-up the invasion of Western Europe, February, March, April, the German economic output enjoyed an enormous hike. It went through the roof because they mobilized just about everything they had left in terms of foreign exchange and raw materials. And for once, everybody pulled in the same direction and it worked. And he kept insisting to the generals at the time, they were still generals who kept, we were running the war economy. Listen, you have to rationalize. You have to rationalize. You have to make things, uh, life easier for yourself. And then you cut down on the number of types of tank, half truck or whatever, and we will get there eventually. And a lot of the evidence, even as early as 1941, was in fact bearing him out. And we have essentially a couple of, uh, a couple, two sets of minutes for a major conference that took place on November 29th, 1941, in the Reich Chancellery, where these very issues are addressed. And again, you don't get the impression that this is somebody who is literally in desperation, who is looking for ways uh, uh, to somehow self-immolate in style to bring the house down. This is somebody who uh, is aware of some of the issues, not all of them, and is, same as the rest of them, groping towards a solution and actually having a rough a pretty good idea how it might be done more effectively. Because many of the pointers he gave them, and which essentially led to the directive of December 3rd, 1941, simplification, rationalization, he had made these points before. This is not something which comes out of the, out of a clear blue sky. So essentially, it's my, one of my smaller chapters. I've been criticized by, by one of my peer review readers for not making it longer, which of course would have entailed even more dramas with my publisher. But basically is that, yes, they, it, there is a problem. They know they have a problem. They know things have to improve. They know that coordination has to be improved. They know that they need more of this kind of labor and more of that, um, more, of, more raw, material, raw materials essentially coming in with power and whatever they need, they need the new system of priorities, but they're getting there. They're getting there and they feel they have a grip on the problem. Okay.
thing is that the disaster outside Moscow, which leads to essentially a complete shift in focus for the war economy, does not happen until late December. Late December, when you finally get a shift in focus away from Gucci kit like this one, okay? Because the production priorities for the German war economy post Barbarossa were supposed to be Navy, to a slightly less extent Air Force, and also tanks. But now, after the outside Moscow, they have not just stalled, they're being furiously counterattacked by the Red Army. They realize that, well, everything else needs to come first. The field army right now doesn't have trucks, it doesn't have jeeps, it doesn't have field kitchens, it doesn't have howitzers, it doesn't have ordinary bolt action rifles. Everything, everything is in short supply. And he finally, on January 10th, 1942, signs the directive that basically says, yeah, right, forget about the enhanced Luftwaffe, forget about the Navy that might con uh, confront the Americans, uh, forget about the enlarged Panzer Army with, with which will invade the Middle East in the summer of 42. Let's just give the field army in, in Russia field kitchens, because that's essentially what they need. But it's only on January 10th. It's not before December 11th. Things are still tickety-boo. There's no indication that anybody's telling him we are doomed. Okay, that comes later. It's just two or three weeks. After two or three weeks that make all the difference in the world. Okay, final point I promise to answer. If Eberhard Jekyll and Ian Kershaw are right that this decision was all about, number one, it's inevitable. The Yanks are coming but in a bad way, as it were. The Yanks are coming. We need to do something. We need to literally grab hold of the Japanese, wed them to us, to make sure that the Americans split their uh, war fighting potential. And what if the Americans decide to ignore you? What if they decide to throw everything they have and the kitchen sink at the European theater of war straight away? Well, he suspected they would not do anything like this because more than about 95% of the world's natural rubber came from a small cluster of Southeast Asian protectorates and colonies. There's only one nation really on the planet that has a fully worked up synthetic rubber industry, and that's Germany. The Americans have much of the technology, but they have dithered, they have wasted time, and they're still essentially toying around with pilot projects. They do not have the potential to find a substitute if literally they were to lose Southeast Asian rubber in one fell swoop. And as late as mid-December 41, we know this because, before because essentially his Luftwaffe ADC, Nikolaus von Belo, um, included this in the original draft for his memoirs, and uh, not the published one which is interesting. There's reference to a remark he made around, it doesn't give a date, but it's, uh, the Americans declared Manila an open city in December 26th, which essentially clearly broadcast to the world that they were losing the fight for the Philippines. And the way Nicolaus von Belo paraphrased the conversation he had with Hitler on the subject, it clearly indicated that the fight for the Philippines might still go either way. And the way Hitler saw it, the Americans will have to throw everything they have into the Southeast Asian theater of operations because they cannot afford to lose the local rubber plantations. Or rather, if they do, then their war effort will grind to a total halt. And he wasn't far off. Was, he, he really was not far off. The way the Americans had made a total hash of essentially gripping this problem in the previous months, um, he wasn't really far off. Okay, briefly. You have to see this decision, irrational as it appears to us, as something that in the, at the moment in time when it was taken was not. Okay, 
Fortnight later, yes. Fortnight later, tumbleweed moment. Like, oh my God, where are those new aircraft prototypes? What's happened to the U-boat training po program? Army group center fighting for its life outside Moscow. But all of that is in the future. We are talking about things that, as far as he could tell, on the eve of December 11, appear to be well in hand. It's all about the here and now. Here and now, and essentially it's a politician, you could say, groping around blindly. Not much different from any other in that regard. Thank you very much.